of the Logger Lecture Series, named after McMaster graduate Albert Abram Logger, a great believer in the value of lifelong education. He created the Albert Abram Logger Foundation, which supports several organizations in their efforts, including the McMaster Alumni Association. The United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are a call to action to end poverty and hunger, protect the planet, and ensure healthy lives, peace, and prosperity by the year 2030. At McMaster, we recognize our responsibility to address these goals as we work together across disciplines and faculties, locally and globally, to create a healthier, brighter world. In 2022, our online Logger Lecture Series will feature talks by McMaster researchers, projects, groups, and alumni to showcase how McMaster is helping to reach these goals. Good afternoon and welcome to this Logger Lecture Online. My name is Jessica Lounsbury and I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement here at McMaster. Over the next two years, our Logger Lecture series of webinars will feature talks on some of the research taking place at McMaster University that is helping reach the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their targets. This afternoon's Logger Lecture will focus on Sustainable Development Goal number six, clean water and sanitation, as guest speaker, Dr. Gail Kranzberg, discusses plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. Dr. Kranzberg is a professor of the Master's in Engineering and Public Policy Program in the Walter G. Booth School of Engineering and Practice and Technology at McMaster University, offering Canada's first master's degree in engineering and public policy. She worked for the Ontario Ministry of the Environment from 1988 to 2001 as coordinator of the Great Lakes programs and senior policy advisor on Great Lakes. In her tenure there, she was intensely engaged in Binational Great Lakes Science and Policy Venue, President of the International Association of Great Lakes Research, Board Member of numerous water-related nonprofits, among other positions. You can read more about Dr. Kranzberg via the link we will put in the chat shortly. If you would like to ask a question, please use type it into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will have some time to answer a few questions at the end of the formal presentation. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gail Kranzberg as she discusses how pollution from plastics pose serious risk to human health and profound consequences on the ecosystem and how regeneration is possible with a little reimagining. Dr. Kranzberg? Thank you very much, Jessica. And thank you everybody who's joined me. I'm going to focus on plastics, but I'm going to focus on a heck of a lot more than that. So I'm going to begin my presentation. So this is about uh, the Great Lakes, which are a magnificent body of water. 20% of all surface water on the planet is here in our Great Lakes. So I wanna talk about the threats to the Great Lakes. And, and it's a global perspective because, I mean, you can see the Great Lakes from outer space. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the water SDG number six. Then I'm going to talk about many of the different insults, including plastic pollution, to the health and integrity of the region and how collective action matters and what's in store for the future of the Great Lakes. So I'll give you a bit of history here. In the 19th century, raw sewage from crossing the boundary waters between Canada and the United States from coast to coast caused cholera epidemics in the 19th century. <clears throat> to address this, Canada, well, actually Great Britain at the time, on behalf of what would become Canada, and the United States signed the Boundary Waters Treaty in 1909. Back in 1909, over 100 years ago, to ensure pollution on one side of the border did not cause injury to the other side of the border. Injury to property, injury to life, injury to natural resources. And it established the Boundary Waters Treaty, the International Joint Commission, to oversee the treaty to regulate lake levels and to do other things. So that's the history of binationalism or internationalism in the Great Lakes region. More recently, if you can consider it compared to 1909, there was a Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of the governments of Canada and the United States. It was signed in 1972 by uh, President Nixon and Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. They weren't the best of friends, but they still saw the importance of the Great Lakes to the health and the economy of the region. And they referred to the International Joint Commission 
the responsibility to review how the, how the two parties, Canada and US, were doing under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement to evaluate their progress and to provide advice to the parties to the agreement. So the Water Quality Agreement was established in 72, it was revised in 78, in 87, and then not until more recently in 2012 was it revised. And what it does is deal with attaining some of these SDG targets. For example, safe and affordable drinking water for all, or equitable sanitation and hygiene for all, improved water quality, and the agreement really did focus a lot on pollution, hazardous chemicals, untreated wastewater, uh, and, and water conservation. Water quality agreement also deals with water use efficiency. Importantly, transboundary cooperation. If you look at a map of the Great Lakes, there's a dotted line. Well, the water doesn't see the dotted line. That's just where Canada and the US drew their boundaries, but the water needs transboundary cooperation. One side doing work and the other side not, doesn't matter. The Water Quality Agreement talks about protecting and restoring the waters of the Great Lakes Basin and the ecosystems and, uh, and participation of local communities is central to the success of protecting, enhancing and restoring the waters of the Great Lakes. But notwithstanding what the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is about, the Great Lakes are on significant system altering stresses. There's a whole range of pressures and threats and insults to the Great Lakes that I wanna go through with you this afternoon. And what I relate to is that these are symptoms of our inability to govern this place well. There's eight Great Lakes states, two provinces, hundreds of municipalities, two federal governments, hundreds of First Nations, like how, how do you govern that? Who's responsible? Everybody, nobody? So I'm gonna reveal, reveal to you some of the ongoing threats to the integrity of the region and then re-emerging and new emerging challenges as well. So if I was in the room, I'd ask you to put up your hand, what is this called? This is the poster child of invasive species in the 1990s, zebra mussel. Zebra mussel came from the Baltic Sea in ships um, that were coming across the ocean. They had to put water in their, in their balance or ballast tanks and they brought zebra mussel into the Great Lakes and they are now everywhere throughout the Great Lakes and permeating right across Canada and the United States. This is another little creature of, that's an invader. This is the round goby and this is interesting. The, then the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, which is now Northern Development, Forestry and Resources, if I can get it right, has a pamphlet out for fishers and says, if you see this fish, freeze it, send it to us, report it, report it. But most of all, if you see this fish, do not use it as bait. Actually, the Ministry of Natural Resources says, if you see this little creature, kill it. Yes, our government's telling us to kill this little fish, invasive. And this is the beautiful purple loosestrife, the Eurasian invader. Uh, you'll see this on the roadsides and disturbed habitats. Um, so it likes wetlands, which are disturbed habitats. And you know, water's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down, dries out, floods. That's what loosestrife likes, but it's very woody. And it's not really yummy <laughs> for wildlife to eat. So it pushes out all the um, edible reeds and marsh grasses and food for wildlife and replaces it with something that's very pretty that was brought in for horticultural ornamental purposes and now wreaks havoc to the wetlands and the wildlife therein in the Great Lakes region. So there's things that we can do. I mean, if you're going to buy or horticultural ornamentals, try and find native trees, plants and species not only do they require less maintenance, they're resilient to our climate, or so far anyway, but they also provide a shelter and food for wildlife and birds and insects and pollinators. This is red o's your dog, or just as an example. Beautiful ornamental in the winter, by the way. Then we have another threat. So invasive species is not a new thing. Some of you may have heard of Asian carp coming up the Mississippi into the same, into the um, into the Illinois River, knocking at the door in Chicago, 
if the Asian carp gets into the Great Lakes, it could absolutely destroy our commercial and recreational fishery, which is worth billions and billions of dollars every year. So it's an ongoing threat that we haven't solved. This is another one. This is a combined sewer that carries um, stormwater and wastewater in one pipe to a wastewater treatment plant. But if we get a severe storm and there's too much stormwater, these are designed to overflow. So they don't wash out all the processes at a wastewater treatment plant. They don't but they do put raw sewage into the Great Lakes. And we see raw sewage overflows from these combined sewers regularly now during severe storm events. And this is the consequence. So 24 hours after a major storm, almost all the beaches in the Great Lakes are gonna be closed unless they have a tank, an engineered tank to capture that overflow so it doesn't go out into the lake. But many of these combined sewers do go out into the lake, making swimmability, which is one of the things people enjoy in the Great Lakes, so difficult to sustain. Another thing that's difficult to sustain is the ability to eat the fish. When I roam around the Great Lakes region and different states and provinces and cities and towns, there's a, a, a sense we want to be able to drink the water, we want to be able to swim in the water, and we want to be able to fish the waters and eat those fish safely. Well, we can't eat the fish safely in most cases. In this case, they're polluted with mercury. So one of the things we try and say is it's complicated. Should we not eat the fish from the Great Lakes? Well, fish are a great source of protein if you're not a vegetarian. I am, so I don't eat the fish, but if I wasn't, I would. So how do we educate people to pick the right fish to eat? And there's a whole number of things you could look up online. So which fish have more chemicals, which fish have less chemicals? Fish that eat from the sediment at the bottom where there's concentration of, of pollution like carp and catfish, they're probably more polluted than things that are lower on the food web like perch and bass. Um, that eat in the middle of the food web. And then things that are around the lakes for a very long time, like a very old, big, gorgeous salmon, that could be more polluted for you. So we need to think about chemicals in fish, but we also need to think about pharmaceuticals and other personal care products. This is more of an emerging issue. So I talked about ongoing issues, raw sewage, inability to eat the fish that's been with us since industrialization came to the Great Lakes and Health Canada put out regulations about what's safe for eating. And Ontario Ministry of the Environment and Natural, Ministry of Natural Resources have a book that you can, you can pick up for what are safe to eat fish. But we have not solved that problem because we have legacies of contaminated sediment at the bottom of the lake from industrial practices in the past. And even when those industries shut down, those chemicals stay around for decades. But now we have more of emerging issues where we talk about BPA in baby bottles, for example, um, or phthalates in the rubber duck that your little baby likes to chew on. There's a lot of chemicals in commerce that disrupt our endocrine system. And so this little baby here is particularly susceptible because it's developing all its organs, it's developing, it's sophisticating its, its, its metabolism, and it's very, very sensitive to changes in the enzymes in its body that are brought about by these kinds of chemicals. These are the kinds of chemicals. Triclosan is an, is an antibiotic that until very recently was in Colgate Total. Why, total, why would you put antibiotics in your mouth? For no reason. Because we know overuse of antibiotics cause superbugs that are resistant to antibiotics. So you have to take more and more of them and then you put them out in the environment because we eliminate them from our bodies. Now you've got antibiotics in the receiving waters or artificial musks or chemical smells. I mean, people have been in a meeting and suddenly you have a headache and somebody's wearing perfume beside you and you understand that's a chemical that's very poisonous to some people. Parabens, phthalates, coal tar derivatives, BAH, BHA, all these sorts of things that are in products, in, in, in cosmetics, so there's been a big push by, I'll just take to Canada for now, but also in the, in the States to ban and phase out many of these things from use um, and in commerce. 
so that they don't get out from our wastewater system into the receiving water, even things like caffeine and birth control pills. We see lots of estradiol. And in fact, it's so severe that you can sample fish at the outfall, outfall of a wastewater treatment plant and find male fish that have ovaries because of all the estrogen in the water. That can't be right. These are some of the insults that made those science, scientists say we're at a tipping point in the Great Lakes region. Now let me come to plastic pollution. This is an image of microplastics, but plastic pollution really came home to me in two different ways. One, I was driving in Mississauga up to a, a beautiful place called Riverwood to visit my husband, who was the executive director of that nonprofit where they do outdoor stewardship and things. And there was a whole field of gulls on a, on a vacant lot. And I was just mesmerized by the gulls until I got closer and they were all plastic bags. Plastic bag. I thought I saw a flock of gulls. It was all plastic bags. So it starts with plastics. You put plastics in your blue bin, you're doing the right thing. But ladies and gentlemen, 70, 80% of what goes in the blue bin ends up in the garbage in your landfills because it's contaminated. So then we have all these plastic bags flying around from the landfills, getting into our water courses and breaking down into smaller and smaller particles like these mi microplastics. There was another time, and I wrote a paper on this because of this experience. I was walking with my husband in Mary Curtis Park, which is in Etobicoke in, in um, West End of Toronto. And we were sitting on a, standing on a pier right after a storm and all of a sudden the pier belched out black water. We were standing on a combined sewer overflow. And as we turned our heads and looked at the shoreline, it was far too colorful. Orange and yellow and green and purple and blue plastics from plastic bottles to tiny little chips of plastic. And it was horrendous to see. This kind of pollution is ubiquitous in the oceans. We've heard of the ocean gyres. It's just as bad in our Great Lakes. And the problem with microplastics is that we've put them into cosmetics. Fortunately, Canada banned the use of microplastics in these nice facial cream scrubs because it's totally unnecessary, but it's in flea strap, it's in our clothing. And when we wash our clothing, if we don't capture them, they go out into the wastewater plant and out into the lakes. They're defined as less than five millimeters in size. And so they look like little foods to, to fish that eat plankton or floating, flo for the non-biologists in the room, floating plants and animals are called plankton. And they're about the size of plankton. So they look like food. So what happens and now, by the way, we're actually looking at nanoplastics, which is even worse. But what happens is, these organisms that eat plankton now fill up their bellies with plastics and they feel satiated, but they're malnourished. Then they get eaten by something next in the food web who's also mal malnourished because they're ingesting a, a food item full of plastic pollution. Um, plastics also absorb organic pollutants. So they're not only an inert problem in your gut, which is you're full of no nutrition in your belly, but you think you're full, they also are highly toxic. And they've, they've been, we've seen everything from choking to fouling of fish gills to reproductive failure. And we actually find it in bottled water. Now, people don't know if the concentration of microplastics in bottled water harms us, but why should we be drinking plastic pieces. It's not part of what we should be doing. So even in the absence of any scientific evidence that it's harmful to us, it sounds an alert. It shouldn't be in our food. It should not be in our water. And it certainly should not be in our lakes where the fish and wildlife cannot avoid it and make a choice. There's been some progress on microplastics. Illinois was the first state in the Great Lakes to ban the manufacture of PCPs or personal care products with microbeads. Um, on Canada followed suit just uh, in, I think, 2019. New Jersey, Michigan, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana, California, Colorado, and all of those other states, as well as some federal commitments, have proposals on the table to ban these. So these are not all Great Lakes states, Michigan, 
New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana are, the rest are not. And some businesses like the Chemical Industry Association of Canada is now taking responsibility for making plastics based out of biological materials to use in personal care products. Plastics that are biologically based that have ad adhesion properties like plastic, because plastics are light, they're good. I mean, a, a plastic container is much lighter than a, a glass container. So you're using less, less energy to, to move it around. So you reduce less, you produce less greenhouse gases, but if they're oil based, that's a problem. So now we have the Chemical Industry Association of Canada and others who are looking at biodegradable and not biodegradable into microplastics, biodegradable into carbon and hydrogen. That's an emerging issue. This is an ongoing issue. This is urban sprawl. I live in Mississauga. I come to campus on the 407 on the GO bus. And I saw, I see on the upper picture, the larger picture here, sprawling communities, just houses and houses on what used to be farmland with big box stores somewhere else. So what do you have to do? You have to get in your car and drive wherever you wanna go. You can't, you, there's no work there unless you're living and working at the big box stores, in which case you have to drive there. You can't get a loaf of bread without getting in your car or your bicycle if you're, if you're really strong to get out there. So with urban sprawl, we pave over the soft green space. We eliminate local agriculture. We have habitat for cars, which, which means more pollution from vehicles that run off of the roads into the lakes with hydrocarbon pollution, with oil, with, with metal pollution, corrosive, corrosive pollution, and we destroy habitat throughout the Great Lakes. In fact, we've destroyed more than 90%, 95% of all the natural wetlands around Lake Erie. It's not easy to get that back. So this is a tribute to the uh, indigenous land acknowledgement. And if you've learned about climate change and you don't really know what it's doing to the Great Lakes, typically, the Great Lakes now are much warmer in the winter months than they ever have been. Used to be every few years, all the Great Lakes would freeze over. Maybe Erie and Ontario, not so much because they're on Southern peer areas, but Huron and Michigan, Superior, absolutely no, no, they don't. Rarely do they. And that means they evaporate during the winter. And you see these lake level drops. This top picture is a, not very useful way of trying to get into a boat because the water's nowhere near the dock. The bottom picture is Wasega Beach. If any of you have been there where these people are walking on that smooth sand, where the sand starts to get bumpy is where the water should be. But Wasega Beach, if you've ever been there, is extremely shallow. I could go out a hundred meters and be at my waist, which is only a few feet. And so if the lakes drop by even a foot, the lake water interface becomes dry land. And that's a huge impact for our infrastructure, our recreational use, but also hydroelectric generation. When the lake levels drop, there's less flow out of St. Lawrence, less hydroelectric energy. When the lake levels drop, ships can't sail with as much cargo in them because they'll hit bottom. So they have to take less cargo, which is more expensive to deliver. The impacts of climate change are enormous. Along with dropping lake levels, we get severe storm events. You think about it, Look, think about it this summer, you'll probably get a period, this has been typical for the last few summers, where you get perhaps July and August, which is almost all drought. And then when you do get a storm, it's a severe downpour and then it stops. Well, by that time, the ground is so parched, it almost acts like, like concrete. It doesn't have the ability to even absorb the rain. And so you get more storm water and then what? More combined sewer overflows, more raw sewage. It's all connected, ladies and gentlemen. So how do we deal with all of this? So I've talked to you about emerging new, re-emerging threats to the Great Lakes but we've had, we have the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, but implementing it, and it has a number of different working plans, they're called annexes, 
for nutrients, for chemicals, for the newest one is climate change. But there is no real accountability and responsibility for implementing the agreement. It's not a treaty. It's a agreement between Canada and the United States. And if the US doesn't do what they said they would do, do you think Canada is taking them to court? No way. Because often Canada doesn't say what they said they would be doing. So this is one of the problems. Where is the accountability to the agreement? The accountability should be to the people of the Great Lakes region and the fish and wildlife there, but there's no clear accountability. And until very recently, there was not a good inclusion and engagement of stakeholders, people from different sectors of society who could find solutions, entrepreneurs who could find new ways, you know, disruptive innovation and new ways of doing business like the Canadian um, the Chemical Industry Association of Canada just stepped up to the plate for. So this has been lacking in the Great Lakes. It's been Environment Canada, United States Environment Protection Agency, let's run the show. That's not good enough. There's eight states, there's two provinces. And like I said before, there's so many other jurisdictions in First Nations. So there's no, there, until recently, there hasn't been a way of trying to collaborative, collaboratively manage and, and to you know, have our federal government show the leadership, but have a coordinated and adaptive process where other stakeholders, other shareholders, other interests, other expertise can come to the table and lend their expertise to the solutions. So in about 10 years ago, 35 or so highly renowned and highly respected Great Lakes scientists proclaimed that in the large areas of the lakes, both historical stress and new ones are reaching a point to tip us into a place where ecosystem level changes will occur rapidly, unexpectedly, and our traditional relationship with stress and response is going out the window. When zebra mussel came in, the whole way nutrients revolve around Lake Erie completely changed. Lake Erie started having algal blooms, even though the amount of phosphorus going to the lake had been dramatically reduced, because zebra mussels change the way nutrients are moving around. In other words, tipping points. The way we did business in the past no longer works in the present and into the future. So these, the management of the Great Lakes is politically and socially charged. Billions of dollars are needed to clean up contaminated sediment, upgrade wastewater treatment plants, um, and this is billions of dollars of both public and private funds. And then we have these things like a changing climate, a growing population. They're all interlinked in the conversation about how do we bring Great Lakes back to excellence. Great Lakes are the economic engine of Canada. Almost 50% of the GDP is here in our Great Lakes. It provides drinking water to 40 million Canadians and Americans. This is not something we should point to our federal governments to do alone. And population is growing. And in the specter of a changing climate where there are communities who's on, who live on islands and those island states will be underwater if they're not already because of rising sea levels, where are they going? They're going somewhere else and they're coming to the Great Lakes region because we have water. Or if you're in, in sub-Saharan Africa and it's, devastating drought, you can't grow things, you can't water your cattle, where are you going to go? You're going to go where there is water. And many of the projections are that the population growth in the Great Lakes region will more than double by 2050. Where do we put all those people? How do we protect the integrity of the region? We can't have more raw sewage, we can't pave over more green space. We need urban intensification, we need land use planners, we need a whole bunch of other disciplines. This is no longer just in the realm of science. And I'm, I'm an environmental scientist and I can tell you this is not to be solved only by environmental science. This is about shared responsibility. There's an interesting little um, crossword puzzle quiz called um, largest bodies of water and the answer is homes. 
and geographically it's incorrect, but it stands for Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior, if you want to name them. But of course it's Superior at the top, Michigan here, Huron in the middle, Erie, and then, and then Ontario out to the St. Lawrence. But this is the Great Lakes seen from outer space. We can see the Great Lakes from outer space and who saw the Great Lakes from outer space? Our famous Canadian astronaut, Dr. Roberta Bondar. She remarked on seeing the Great Lakes from outer space. And I wanna to mention to you, right June 1st into your calendars, we are 99.9% .9 confident that we will be hosting Dr. Roberta Bondar on campus on June 1st from 10 to 11 o'clock to talk to our students, to talk to our alumni, to talk to the community about her passion, not Great Lakes passion, her passions about imagination, about challenges, about, well, everything that she's about. I just thought I'd, we just confirmed that this morning, so I'm very stoked about getting Dr. Roberta Bondar when I look at the Great Lakes from outer space. So in fact, the enemy is us. We can't point, oh, big industry, you did it to us. Well, industry, Stelco and DeFasco did what they did they, when they were doing it because they were allowed to. We didn't have ministries of environment. We didn't have Environment and Climate Change Canada back in the 1900s. They came out in the 70s. So we are all responsible for this. In fact, everything that you put down your drain has an impact on the Great Lakes, whether it's benign, Congratulations, whether it's not, well, it's just a little bit of oil. Cumulatively, we all make that difference. So this is a multinational problem. We talked about the Great Lakes up until most recently about a binational pro problem. And now with truth reconciliation and our eyes more wide open, this is a multinational because of all the First Nations in the Great Lakes region. So we didn't have, the, the 1987 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was not revised until, until relatively recently. So we had lots of policies and lots of scientific knowledge that the governments were not even paying attention to. Fortunately, in 2013, a new protocol was updated to include a number of different areas of focus to coordinate the activities of the federal governments explicitly stating with the provinces, with states, with, with municipalities, with Métis, with First Nations, with tribes, with other organizations. It's right up front in the front of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that this is multinational and cooperative and collaborative agreement it has to be done in a coordinated fashion. So the opportunity now is the Great Lakes Protocol of 2012. And I'm going to share with you, aside from this beautiful picture of our wonderful Great Lakes, what the focus is on going forward. We, the governments of Canada and the United States, all of us who live and breathe the Great Lakes regime, say that the Great Lakes must provide a source of safe, high quality drinking water for everybody. We should be able to swim and have other recreational activities unrestricted by bacterial contamination or pathogens. Same thing with fish and wildlife consumption, unrestricted by pathogens or chemicals uh, of, of, of like PCBs, mercury, lead, and other things. We also wanna make sure that we have enough habitat to sustain our native species because we've destroyed habitat all over the place. Look at where DeFasco and Stelco are. That, those were wetlands. Look at what the CN Tower is. That was underwater, those were wetlands, that wasn't even a highway. The CN Tower was an under, underwater and there were wetlands north of that. We've destroyed it, so now we need to come bring habitat back. We want to make sure the Great Lakes are free from pollutants that could harm us or other users of the region, be free from the excessive amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen that pr promote excessive amounts of algae, and some of the, what they promote is what's called cyanobacteria, which is actually a photosynthetic bacteria that produce a toxin that shuts down drinking water supplies. In fact, in late summer, if you're walking down the, by the beach and there's a big bluish green slick of algae and you're walking with your dog, do not let your dog in the water. Your dog drinks that water, it could kill the dog. That's how serious these toxic al algal blooms are. 
So we want the lakes to be free from aquatic invasive species like the zebra mussel, like the round goby, like pupro loosestrife, like emerald ash borer and so on and so forth, like Asian carp. We don't want contaminated groundwater going into the Great Lakes uh, and any other substances like plastics. We want the lakes to be free from those. So each one of these bullets is an annex in the agreement. And they also we also talk about changing climate and adapting and making our communities more resi resilient to a changing climate. That's a new annex in the water quality agreement. So as I wind this up, I've spent most of my career working in one way or another in the Great Lakes, whether it was my postdoc, uh, working at the Ministry of the Environment, working as the director of the Great Lakes Office of the International Joint Commission, my research right now. And myself and my colleagues believe you need a lake by lake strategy. And we do have, there's a Lake Superior plan, there's a Lake Erie plan, there's Lake Ontario plan that includes the watersheds, the near shore environments, and that includes landowners, industry, businesses, municipalities, tribes, First Nations, academics, working to bring back that lake one by one. Communities of shared common practice. My best example of an epistemic community is the Fish Great Lakes Fishery Commission. The members of the Fishery Commission are devoted to a healthy fishery. There's something that unites them. The healthy fishery is what makes life important to them. We need to unite people and what's important to them, being, being able to get back to the lakes, drink the water, swim in the water, eat the fish, know that the toxins are not there to harm you, know that your dog is safe to swim in the fish, and that the, the excellence of the environment in the Great Lakes is a social equity, recreation. If COVID-19 has taught us nothing else that nature heals, the beautiful and spectacular nature of the Great Lakes needs to be regenerated for social well-being. But the economy of the region hugely depends on the quality of the waters. Because you're taking really polluted water out of the Great Lakes and you want to process that into drink or food, it's going to cost you an enormous amount of money. So bringing back the Great Lakes is not just an environmentalist's passion. It has the attributes of the sustainable pillars, right? cultural integrity, social well-being, economic success, and environmental integrity. So we need to ensure that we share our responsibilities, that inclusion and engagement is always first and foremost, so that more and more people can, can figure out how to make their place, place in the Great Lakes much more great, like volunteer to help clean up Hamilton Harbor, and that we, as we talk to our politicians about investing in Great Lakes excellence, it's investing in the economy of the region. We have in the United States, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and it was passed by the Bush administration with no funding. The Obama administration came in and authorized $4 million, $400 million a year. Through the Biden administration, it's now close to $350 million a year. When Trump came in, he squash it, he removed it from the budget and the Great Lakes Sen senators and governors, didn't matter if they're Republican or conservative said, no way, we are not allowing you to cut that funding for the Great Lakes restoration because it builds the economy of our region and they won. They pushed back and the restoration initiative moved forward. So integrating social values and economic excellence into the environmental imperative, I think is a way to dissect this problem and have it shine. My opinion that we enhance our Great Lakes place by place by place by making each of our communities more sustainable, paying more attention to the SDG number six in terms of water, place by place by place. You can't tackle the Great Lakes as a whole. Most people don't care. They care about where they live by their waterway. That's fine. Cumulatively, we make that difference. We need to engage youth so much. So often we go to Great Lakes events, Great Lakes meetings. And I worry, where, where are the 20 and 30 year olds? Like youth here is now 45, but I mean, I'm just talking about 25 and 35, where are they? Let's engage youth and renovate responsibilities and accountabilities. Hold our political leaders accountable to keep their promises. 
every time there's an election, what are you going to do for the global benefit of the Great Lakes and the Canadian benefit for the Great Lakes, let alone the, the multinational benefit of the Great Lakes? So I think it's worth protecting. So we need to persevere, continually have our voices heard. And with that, I want to open it up for questions and thank you for listening and thank you for helping to make the lakes great. Thank you very much, Dr. Kranzberg. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions to please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will uh, answer them now. So I've got one right now and it says, in Hamilton, a developer wants to build a warehouse on a wetland in Ancaster above the escarpment and proposes to replace it with a human made new wetland somewhere nearby. My question is, are wetlands connected to the Great Lakes and can wetlands be built to immediate replace ones that are destroyed? Oh, a fascinating question. Um, the good news is that they pledged to, if they're filling one in, they're pledged to put one back that's required. Wetlands are the biological engines of the Great Lakes. Those wetlands are connected to the Great Lakes. Absolutely, they are. You can construct wetlands. Um, typically, we tend to construct wetlands to polish streams. Let's say an urban stream that's about to go into the lake but has all sorts of sediment in it and dirt in it from the roads. We construct the wetland to slow down that water sediment out the particles that have the pollution and let the water go out into the lakes. Constructive wetlands, depending on where they are, can be dangerous for fish and wildlife. If you, and they, they will never completely replicate a natural wetland, but if they're put remote to an urban setting, uh, and Ancaster could be, could be found to have a place remote to an urban setting, it can be done. So yes, they're connected to the Great Lakes and I'm glad you added that they were considered that they're planning to replace it with a with a, a man-made wetland. That's positive. Um, what can we do at home? Um, do our little part to help promote the health and keep plastics and other pollutants out of Great Lakes. What are some recommendations you might have? Plastic straws are the stupidest invention on earth. So. <laughs> So uh, that's just my point of view, but it, my point is you the right point of view on that one. Um, so why do you need to put bananas in a plastic bag? They already have their own container. Well, I mean, I go to, I, I do shop. I have to admit I shop at Whole Foods because I'm vegan and it's hard to find food some places. And, and I see people there put one, plat, one apple in a plastic bag. I mean, they should, you would think people who are shopping at a Whole Foods kind of eco-friendly green, refuse plastics as much as possible. If I wanna buy 10 apples, I put 10 apples in my basket and I bring 10 apples to my fridge and I put 10 apples in my fridge. Why do you need a plastic bag for that? There are cloth replacements for everything now on the market. If you are afraid that you're going into a restaurant and you don't know how clean the glass is, you can buy a metal straw, a bamboo straw. They're all reusable. Um, you never take a plastic bag from a shopping, from a grocery shop. I mean, I have a trunk full of, of, of reusable um, cloth bags. Um, if you send me your name, I'll send you two dozen of them because every time you go somewhere, somebody gives you one as a gift. Use your own plastic. Um, I actually, when I do have to buy something that it's in a plastic bag, like a loaf of bread, I use that plastic bag to wrap up things that I would normally use plastic wrap for. So I do buy meat for my husband. If I want to take a chicken breast and wrap it up from my freezer, I use a bread bag. That's a plastic bag. Reuse the plastic until it falls apart, but mostly refuse it. I used to go into a grocery store down the street for me and they would always have like five cobs of corn on a cell on a on a styrofoam plate with plastic around it and I just went up to the produce manager and said can you go in the back and get me five just five years of corn without any wrapping oh sure so ask for that talk to the merchants talk to the store owners and say why do you have your avocados or your or your why is why is your avocado wrapped in plastic you know, why, why do you have, you know, just question it and refuse. But most important, if you have plastic in your house, use it, use it, use it until it falls apart. You have to put it in the blue bin at its end of the life. Unfortunately, um, that may not be the best solution for it, but at least eliminating it from your, from your everyday things. There's beeswax covered materials that you can use to wrap up, wrap up cakes and casseroles and everything else. There's all sorts of substitutes. Do a little bit of research. It's easy to do. 
Those are some great suggestions. Thank you. Um, what explains the very low water levels you showed back in 2007 versus the very high waters just a few years ago? So this is not an easy um, question to, to, to ask. You, you sort of need to be an astrophysicist to kind of totally understand this. There's a few things going on. The Great Lakes cycle on their own every 25 years to high levels and low levels. That's partly because the, the Great Lakes are a bathtub with glacial waters in them. The, the Great Lakes are just renewed by rainwater every year. So the, the great the glaciers came into the region and then when they left, they, they scoured up these places, left their waters, and that's what we have. We have we have a bathtub. That's the Great Lakes Basin. But every every so often the base of the Great Lakes rises and retracts from, from glacial rebound. Uh, and also there's a, again, a cyclical up and down cycles. So put that in the background. There's a hundred year cycle over that. There's a 25 year cycle. If you're in a hundred year cycle that happens to be low and you superimpose on that the 25 year cycle that's low and you had a warm winter, boom, your light levels are way down. If you're on a high water period, like, like above average waters and you have an extensive downfall of rain all spring long and the, so much so that the, the grounds are completely saturated there's no more place for the water to go then the lake levels rise which is exactly what we saw when we saw the flooding in the islands in the toronto islands we had an extreme wet period during the, when the lakes are naturally high and the land was so saturated it just ran back off into the great lakes Thank you for that. Uh, our next question is, is there funding beyond the municipal level to replace combined sewers and expand water treatment facilities? Mm. It depends on the size of the municipality and, and the tax base of the municipality. Um, it, it, the, there's not a lot of effort on realigning combined sewers into a unit and, and you know, separating them out. The investment team seems to be more uh, uh, feasible to put the de underground detention chambers. So if you know that there's a combined sewer overflow coming into an area that is a beach area, you can intercept the overflow in an underground detention tank. And then when waters subside, subside, you can pump that water back to the sewage treatment plant for treatment. If you're in a municipality, but for wastewater treatment upgrades, um, I know under the last, there's a Canada-Ontario agreement respecting the Great Lakes Basin ecosystem and human health. There is cost sharing between federal and provincial governments with municipal governments if the tax base is fairly low. So I know on North Shore of Lake Superior, they got a lot of funding. I don't know that Toronto would ever get federal funding for, for wastewater. Uh, I'm virtually certain not because it has a tax base. So it's a complicated question. It, the answer, unfortunately, is it depends. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question, from a policy perspective, where should our government be focusing their efforts to continue to ensure that we are protecting the Great Lakes? And how can we as individuals get involved to support? The policy perspective is actually written to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement itself. The Canada signed on to 10 different annexes where it will do its best to control chemical new chemicals, control nutrient enrichment, clean up the areas of concern like the remedial, like Hamilton Harbor Remedial Action Plan, invest in that, invest in lake-wide management plans, invest in climate change resilient, invest in invasive species and control, invest in, in, in habitat restoration. All those things are, are policy directions that the government have put into place. Perhaps one of the things we can think about um, is some of the overarching threats that exacerbate other things. Um, one of them is, uh, is, is climate change. And while we hear a lot of talk about carbon tax and greenhouse gas mitigations and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, that's all important, but it doesn't solve the problem that climate change is impacting the Great Lakes now. And no matter how much we reduce greenhouse gases, it's not going to change the fact that we're going to flood people out of existence, that we're going to destroy wetlands because of it. So investing in adaptation plans helping municipalities figure out how to make their communities more resilient to the change in climate so that you're not getting basement flooding, you're not washing people out of their properties, you're not getting huge infrastructure damages. 
that might be one of the priority areas that the governments could invest in. Yes, mitigation, absolutely don't, I'm, I'm on board with that. But municipalities have made their voices heard. There's something called the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Mayor's Initiative. And they've written to the governments of Canada and the United States saying, as municipalities, we need help to adapt to the changing climate. And perhaps that's one thing that we as citizens can ask our federal governments to invest in. Thank you. Uh, someone asks, is there a way we can test the quality of our drinking water at home? My family drinks a lot of bottled water because we live in an apartment and the tap water quality seems questionable at times. Is there a way to test or improve it? Is there a type of bottled water that has is less harmful, less BPA, less plastics? So I'm not aware of home testing kits for water, much other than pH, turbidity, which you can see anyway. You can see if your water is Get, get sediment at the bottom of your glass at the end of the day. That's not a good thing. You shouldn't be drinking that. Or if it comes out of your tap yellow because you've got iron or rust or something. I don't think you can actually test your drinking water. Is there lead in my pipes? And that's something if you're in an old apartment building, you'd be worried about. So um, one thing you can do is send samples. You can talk to some private labs, send samples, get them to send you the right type of, of sampling equipment, send samples. Unfortunately, it'll come out of your pocket unless you get your you know, your landlord to agree to it. Um, as for drinking water, um, I don't know your specific situation, but by and large, drinking water is more heavily regulated than bot bottled water is. And in many situations, drinking water from your tap is cleaner than bottled water. Um, BPA is no longer in plastics, so you don't have to worry about that. That's been banned. Uh, BPA in cans has been banned. Um, not that you buy canned water, I'm just saying, you know, BPA is not the issue but there will be plastic particles in bottled water, period. Um, so if you can test, get your water tested and assure yourself that you're not getting lead in your water, for example, that's probably the biggest concern. Um, drinking water responsibilities, municipalities have to report to the province of Ontario, either through their own weight drinking water treatment systems or ones run by provincially operated drinking water systems and tap drinking water tends to be the safest drinking water that you could have compared to bottled water. I know that's a shock, but it's it's a fact. That's great information, thank you. Uh, you had mentioned um, about getting younger people involved. If we have younger people in our lives, um, how can we encourage them or what can we do to help them become more involved in um, things like this? Make the connection between where your water comes from and what you're doing to the water. So it's an interesting question to ask yourself, where does your, and, and, and we do this all the time, where does your water come from? Um, the tap. Okay. How does your water get to the tap? Mm, the city. Okay. Where does the city get their water? And that's usually where it ends. I have no idea. Well, it's getting it from the lakes in most cases in the Great Lakes. I and mean, some of it is groundwater and, you know, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, that kind of thing. But most of it is from the Great Lakes. So first of all, do, do your kids know where the, great, where the water comes from? Then when you pour your water down the sink, where does it go? Uh, it goes away. Okay, where does it go? Uh, so it goes to a treatment facility. Very good. And then where does it go from there? It goes back to the lake. And guess what? The treatment facility is just designed to treat certain things, not everything. So if you were sick and you got some medication and you no longer need the medication, you want to get rid of the medication, pour it down the sink, pour it, flush it down the toilet. Well, wait a minute, it's going to go back out into the lakes, which is the source of your drinking water. So, so insert some sort of sense of the cycle of water and each of our responsibilities to protect ourselves, to protect, if they don't care about fish and wildlife, they're not a tree hugger like Gail's a tree hugger, I think you can sense that by now protect themselves and their families by doing the right thing to protect the water. But there are other things they can do, sign up for, for clubs. I mean, is there, is there a tree planting going on in our neighborhood near a stream, for example, get involved. Go, you know, conservation authorities are always having education and outreach days, you know, go down to the stream, lift up a rock. Is there a little creature living on there, under there? Isn't that fascinating? Learn a bit about the biology of the creek. And, you know, maybe you, maybe you do like to fish with your family. Well, 
how, why is there fish there? Because there's food for fish. But if the pollution was there, there wouldn't be food for fish. So just making the connections, but particularly where do your water come from and where does it go? I think that's a good start. Oh, that's great. And uh, I will take this one last question here and it's, it's sort of related um, and further to the question about home actions on how to reduce. Um, how can we convince people that every small action matters, such as the ones with plastic bags or um, those who only drink purchased plastic bottled of water? Um, people think their own personal action doesn't matter because it's too small. How, to, how do we talk to people about that and changing their mindset? What a perfect last question. I, I, I have an answer, but I also have a short story. And I know we're running out of time, but it's an important story. The impacts, the insults on the Great Lakes at the turn of last century, in the 19, 1900s to, to 1950s, 1980s, were pipes from industry. We shut down the pipes from industry pretty much. We regulated industry. The insults to the Great Lakes now are us. They're diffuse. Every choice that we make, every pesticide we can't do now, every fertilizer that you put on your garden that ends up in the sewer and everyone on your block that's doing that, that's what insults the Great Lakes now. Industry has cleaned up their act. But let me tell you the starfish story. And I, I'll try and do this because I think it's a nice way to close. So early one morning, um, a, a, a senior walks out onto the, onto the ocean, uh, to the beach and sees a youngster ahead of ahead of the, the senior. And the youngster's bending down, standing up, bending down, standing up, bending down, standing up. And the elder doesn't know what's going on. He gets closer and he sees it bending up, standing, bending down, standing up and throwing something. As he got closer, he asked the youth, the youngster, what are you doing? So, well, the tide is out and there's like the starfish here. There's starfish on, on, on the beach and if they don't get back into the, into the lake, they'll die. And the elder said, are you, you, what are you talking about? This beach goes on for miles. There's got to be thousands of starfish. How can what you're doing make a difference? So the youngster bends down, picks up the starfish, looks at the starfish, throws it in the ocean, made a difference to that one. Cumulative, cumulative action. I'll turn it back to Jessica. That's great. Thank you very much. And, and very, very true story how small uh, small actions can have great impact. Um, so I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, and taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to our group. Um, following the webinar, viewers will receive an email link to a survey. If you can kindly take a minute to fill it out, we appreciate your feedback. Our next logger lecture supporting the sustainable development goals will take place on Wednesday, April 6th at 7 p.m. with Dr. Sean Carey, and we'll focus on how Canada's North is changing and what it means for the future. To register for that talk, please visit our website at alumni.mcmaster.ca forward slash events, or we will put a link in the chat shortly. Dr. Kranzberg, thank you so much again for your wonderful talk this afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.